Good morning, LCF. It's nice to be with you this morning. Um, we're glad that you could come and join us. Um, and we hope you're enjoying some beautiful weather. We're just so thankful for that this weekend. Uh, just leading into our, our service this morning and worship, I wanted to read something from John chapter 12. Six days before the Passover, Jesus therefore came to Bethany, where Lazarus was, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. So they gave a dinner for him there. Martha served, and Lazarus was one of those reclining with him at the table. Mary therefore took a pound of expensive ointment made from pure nard and anointed the feet of Jesus and wiped his feet with her hair. The house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. And as I was reading that this week in my time with the Lord, I, I was struck by Mary's actions. You know, she's responding here in thanksgiving and worship of Jesus because he had just raised Lazarus, her brother, from the dead. And this is what she gave. And her perfume, you know, it was extravagant. It was a whole year's worth of perfume that she poured on. Like, so it's like what, whatever we make in a year, we give to Jesus on Sunday morning, like today. You just give it all to him. And then she wiped his feet with her hair. And I thought, goodness, I, I don't know if I want to wipe someone's feet with my hair and and yet that that didn't bother her and the, the room was filled with people and she wasn't embarrassed she just did it and that spoke to me about worship and coming and this morning when you come and, and you're here and you're ready to sing and and pray and worship that you want to give we want to give our everything to Jesus we want our worship to be extravagant to him and and personal and intimate you know Mary wiping his feet with her hair I mean letting her hair down I mean that was it probably just crazy at those times and so I just feel I want to pray for us this morning that Lord that you would speak and you would move and Jesus may we give you all of our worship this morning that we would hold nothing back before you because you died and you rose from the dead and you were in heaven and you are going to come back <laughs> and you are preparing a place for us and all these beautiful promises that you have for us, Lord. And there's nothing in us, but we need to do but just give you everything, like everything, Jesus, that we have. We want to hold nothing back in our worship this morning because you are the King of kings and you are the Lord of lords. And yet, and you are also so personal and kind and you love each and each each of us, Lord. So I just thank you so much for that. Thank you that you are here. We are here to worship you above all. <laughs> I'm going to give you it all, our time, <laughs> our finances, our things, Jesus, that you, we are here to just worship you.
worship you with all that we are and all that we have, just as we are, Lord, but but we want to be changed. (laughs) We want to be changed with you, Jesus.
of the goodness of God. Lord, I just pray that you would just keep reminding us of your goodness. And we wouldn't forget, we'd see those moments each and every day that you have met with us and that you are there with us, and that you never leave us. Thank you for your presence, Lord Jesus. And we rest in you. Good morning, church. Welcome. It's good to be together. What a great time of worship. I enjoy these times of live worship together as a family so much. And I trust that they're a blessing to you as well in these days. We have a few short notes that we want to make you aware of as a church. So here we go. First, we want to invite you to our devotional podcast called Following the Way that we're putting out several times every week. It's available on Apple Podcasts and on Spotify. Search LCF Landmark and you'll find us. Or you can get it on our YouTube channel as well if you search up Landmark Christian Fellowship. It's a great way to supplement your devotional life and to help you draw closer to Jesus. And so I want to invite you to check that out. We also have prayer this week, uh, two times. We have begun meeting again at the building, 6.30 a.m. on Tuesdays. We pray together till 7.30, and it's a great way if you want to physically join us. We want to invite you to that. We're also meeting together on Zoom, 9 p.m. on Wednesday evenings. We feel that the Lord is calling us to continue in this and to pursue Him in prayer in these days. And so we're really excited for what He's doing Coming up, we're going to be having a discussion this morning as elders around this thing of renewal and cultivating renewal in our lives. And we really believe that prayer is part of that in the preparation and contending for renewal in our lives. Prayer is such a major, significant part of that. And so we want to invite you, come out, join us Wednesday nights or Tuesday mornings as we pray and as we seek the Lord together. And we're praying that he would increase our hunger and the work of renewal in us during these days. We're going to take up our tithes and offerings in a moment as well. I just want to also make a note that uh, we have been working with Michaela Plett and MSG Canada to get her set up for donations uh, with her work with Love's Door. And so uh, that is uh, happening. And Michaela is going to be doing a letter that she's going to be sharing shortly um, inviting people who want to partner with her and supporting her with Love's Door. And so just want to make you aware of that and watch for that email that we'll be sending out shortly. Uh, as it pertains to tithes and offerings, if you would like to uh, drop your tithes at the church, uh, we can certainly do that. So please just contact us if you would like to make arrangements for that during the week. Uh, if not, the giving information will be on the screen right away of how you can give online. I want to thank you for being faithful in that and supporting the ministry of the church. And right after that, we're going to have a kids video for you. So kids, uh, watch out for that. Hey, yo! Stories of the Bible. Jesus feeds the 5,000. This is Jesus. hey -o! Who is the Son of God and the Savior of the world. While Jesus was on earth, he taught everyone about God's love. He did many miracles and healed people of their sickness. Oh, hey, everyone. A huge crowd kept following him wherever he went because they saw his miraculous signs as he healed the sick. A crowd started to gather around Jesus. There were 5,000 men and many more women and children. Turning to Philip, he asked, Hey, Philip! Where can we buy bread to feed all these people? You see, Jesus was testing Philip, for he already knew what he was going to do. Um... Philip replied, Even if we worked for months, we wouldn't have enough money to feed them. Hey, I got an idea. Then Andrew spoke up, There's a young boy here with five barley loaves and two fish. But what good is that with this huge crowd? Jesus said, Tell everyone to sit down. Bye, everyone. 
down, sit down. Then Jesus took the loaves, gave thanks to God, and gave them to the people. There you go. Afterward, he did the same with the fish, and they all ate as much as they wanted. Want some more? I'm all good, thanks. After everyone was full, Jesus told his disciples, now gather the leftovers so that nothing is wasted. You guy. So they picked up the pieces and filled 12 baskets with scraps left by the people who had eaten from the five barley loaves and two fish. In a few minutes, we're going to have a roundtable discussion coming up that we filmed this week as elders around the topic of renewal and how we foster and pursue it in our lives. We had a great time filming it, really enjoyed it, and felt the Holy Spirit moving and speaking to us as we did that. And I trust that you're going to really enjoy it as you partake of it. But before we do that, we have a video from the Bible Project that we want to show you that looks at the gospel of the kingdom and how that works in our lives. And I think it'll be a great way to prepare us for our discussion. So enjoy. There's this beautiful poem. It's in the book of Isaiah. The city of Jerusalem has just been destroyed by Babylon, a great kingdom in the north. And all of these Jewish people, they've been sent away into exile, but a few remained in the city. And they're left wondering, what just happened? Has our God abandoned us? Right, because Jerusalem was supposed to be the city where God would reign over the world to bring peace and blessing to everyone. Now Isaiah had been saying that Jerusalem's destruction was a mess of Israel's own making. They had turned away from their God, become corrupt, and so their city and their temple were destroyed. Yeah, everything seems lost. But the poem goes on. There's a watchman on the city walls. And far out on the hills, we see a messenger. And he's running towards the city. He's running and he's shouting, good news. And Isaiah says, how beautiful on the mountains are the feet of those who bring good news. Beautiful feet? Yes. The feet are beautiful because they're carrying a beautiful message. What's the message? that despite Jerusalem's destruction, Israel's God still reigns as king, and that God himself is going to one day return to this city, take up his throne, and bring peace. And the watchmen sing for joy because of the good news that their God still reigns. Now in the New Testament, we find this same phrase, the good news. It's the Greek word euangelion, and it's also sometimes translated with the word gospel. Yeah, so when Christians say, do you believe the gospel, they mean, do you believe the news? But not just any news. In the Bible, this phrase is always about the announcement of the reign of a new king. And in the New Testament, the Gospels use this phrase to summarize all of Jesus' teachings. They say that he went about proclaiming the good news of God's kingdom. So Jesus saw himself as the messenger, bringing the news that God reigns. Yes, but the way that he described God's reign, it surprised everybody. I mean, think, a powerful, successful kingdom. It needs to be strong, able to impose its will, able to defeat its enemies. But Jesus said the greatest person in God's kingdom was the weakest, the one who loves and who serves the poor. And he said that you live under God's reign when you respond to evil by loving your enemies and forgiving them and seeking peace. This is an upside down kingdom. Now Jesus also said that this kingdom was arriving with him. Yeah, so for example, there's this really interesting story where there's a high ranking Roman officer and he comes to Jesus begging him to heal his servant. And he even calls Jesus his Lord, acknowledging that Jesus is his authority. Jesus praises this man for recognizing what no one else yet had, that not only was Jesus announcing God's kingdom, he was the king. And so the word gets out that this Jewish man from Galilee is talking and acting like he's the king of Israel. He's appointing 12 disciples, which are an image of Israel's 12 tribes. He's healing people forgiving people their sins. And all of this so threatened Israel's leaders that they finally decide to have him killed. And Jesus let them. Yeah, which is a weird thing to do if you're trying to become king. That's right, but for Jesus, this is what had to happen. 
Jesus saw the sin and the devastation of his people Israel as just one small part of the entire human condition. How all humanity has rebelled against God, resulting in the tragedy and devastation of our whole world. So how is God going to bring his reign over such a world? Jesus believed it would be through an act of sacrificial love for his enemies. This is why in the Gospels, Jesus' crucifixion is depicted as his enthronement as the king of the Jews. Yeah, he receives a crown. He also receives a robe. He's exalted up, not onto a throne, but onto the cross. How beautiful are the feet that bring good news. And the good news now is that Jesus has defeated death and that he reigns as king, that he's dealt with our sin and corruption himself and that he's conquered it with his life and with his love. And then Jesus sends his followers to go out and keep announcing this good news of the upside down kingdom. And to invite everyone to give their allegiance to him, the king who defeated death with his love. Good morning, everyone. We want to welcome you here. We are so glad to be together again, and we're glad to be doing something different. We are doing something very different this morning, uh, different format. And just so you know, so there's no confusion, this is the message for this Sunday. Um, the reason we're doing this is online. The church is providing us some opportunities to do some different things. And so we thought that we would have a discussion this morning around a topic that is the focus of a book that we've recently been reading together as elders and we've been discussing together. And so we're going to talk this morning about fostering patterns of renewal uh, in our lives and in the church and what that looks like. And so we're going to do that by talking through a chapter in a book that we've been really impacted by. Um, And we thought that this was also an opportunity to welcome the church into a discussion that is very near to our hearts for the church and this work of renewal, the process of renewal, and that there is a pattern to renewal for our lives. And so, yeah, welcome. Good Um, morning, church. (laughs) We we hope that this is going to be impromptu and we hope that it will be authentic and um, I'm sure that we're going to have some mistakes and maybe some speaking over one another today, but we'll We'll try our best to make this work. Um, just some background on kind of where this has come for us. Uh, my brother-in-law, who's a pastor in Vancouver, he introduced me to a guy by the name of John Mark Comer a while back. He's a pastor in Portland who leads a church there, and he does a podcast called This Cultural Moment. In fact, um, that podcast, it's a fascinating look at how um, look at how we to live in this current Western climate as a disciple of Jesus and how we do that. And so... Uh, Actually, I wove a lot of the thoughts from that podcast into our 1 Corinthians series that we were in last fall and earlier this year. Just a lot of profound insight that I I felt applied. But the other half of that podcast is a guy by the name of Mark Sayers. And he's the pastor of Red Church in Melbourne, Australia. And a really neat guy with a neat accent. Um, And Mark and John Mark, um, they have a pastor network, actually includes a guy by the name of Jason Ballard, you might know him. He's on the Youth Alpha series in Canada um, from Vancouver. And John Tyson, a guy who leads a church in New York called Church of the City. Um, And and these guys together have a passion for a move of God and a work of renewal in our culture. And I, I would even say that they're almost like prophetic voices in our culture that right now that are speaking to things. And Mark uh, Sayers uh, in particular has a, a brilliant handle um, of culture in the Western world and has a fascinating prophetic insight into where the church finds itself right now. And so he wrote a book. Uh, this is the book here. I'm going to take Carlin's copy because it looks better than mine, but it's called The Reappearing Church. And so I, I asked the guys here if we could read this together as elders, and they graciously obliged. And so we've been reading this and discussing this for the past while. And so we're, we're still in the midst of discussing this book. Um, we're going through it. But it's a book that puts forth this hope for renewal in the rise of our post-Christian culture. And I would even I would encourage you, if, you, if you're maybe spurred or stirred by this conversation, they buy this book. Um, We'll actually, we'll give a link to it um, at the end of the message. We'll give a link to this book, but it's a phenomenal book to read for yourself. 
Um, but it's, it's talking about renewal, hope for renewal in our post-Christian culture, and it very much is a post-Christian culture that we're living in. It's, it's fascinating insight, incredibly challenging, incredibly thought-provoking. Uh, and, and I know for me, what it's been doing is it's been stirring hunger for God to move in me as I've been reading it and contemplating it and, and praying through it. So um, why don't we pray, and then we'll, then we'll dig in. Jesus, we, we want to welcome you here this morning. We, we want to welcome you into our conversation, into um, everything that we're going to think through. And Holy Spirit, we're going to ask, actually, that you'd be speaking to us, that you'd be putting things into our thoughts that you want to bring forth. And Lord, I want to pray for all of us watching as well, Jesus, that as we're watching through screens, the Holy Spirit, you would be moving in our hearts. Right now, Holy Spirit, would you come and you move in our hearts this morning? to just do a profound work, Lord, that you'd actually birth and, and light that, the embers in us, that flame of renewal inside yes. us. Um, and so, Jesus, we invite you to do everything that you want to do this morning. We glorify you, and Father, we praise you. We're mm -hmm. so grateful. Mm -hmm. Pray this in your name. Amen. 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 So, question, Larry, Carlin, to you guys, what was your initial reaction to the book? Uh, so far, as you as you've been reading it, um, one of one of the thoughts that I wrote down was that I think as reading it, I think it, I felt like I wanted to be a part of God's plan and what God's doing. And so, if He's doing renewal, then it gave me the hope. And but I want it made me want to be a part of it. And then, uh, secondly, I just had to ask the question of what do I need to do to be a part of it, right? Um, so those were two, two thoughts that I had. Hmm. I think for me, um, one of the more thought-provoking questions was, you know, how do I see myself being a part of renewal? And how do I, how do I see myself hmm. as a person who is in the business world and then having where I maybe feel like time because I know that God desires our hearts and, and to to have time with us and and so for me it's it's just um, challenged I think me in a, again just in a new way to um, desire a, a deeper walk with the Lord to um, find myself in a place where I'm drawing near to him because I, I really feel like in, re in reading this book that there's a challenge for the church and I think all of us inwardly have that desire to have renewal but there's a in me there was a bit of an element of fear of how do I how do I see this come about and, and so, yeah, that, that was probably for me the, the thoughts I had initially in reading the book and, and, and then getting into it more. It's, it's encouraging, but definitely challenging. Yeah. So this morning we want to have a conversation here around a specific topic in the book, a specific chapter. Um, that really, though, it's, it sort of prefaces the, the rest of the book. Um, and sort of sets the stage for it. But it's talking about this pattern of renewal for our lives mm -hmm. and for the church. And so before I do that, I want to just preface it by saying that our belief, and we were just talking about this actually before we went on the camera, is that the Western church is in need of renewal, that, that we are really in need of a move of God, as in past generations that will radically transform the church and the lives of people. It's characterized by a move of the Holy Spirit that brings deep transformation in our lives and in those around us. And so, you know, like the Great Awakenings that happened with Jonathan Edwards and the Welsh Revival in the early 1900s, the Azusa Street Revival as well, the Jesus People Movement in the 1970s that changed a generation of people, and even closer to home, Prairie Fire, which some of us remember from the 1990s, yeah. that was just I remember it well. Yeah, I remember it as a teenager. We were we were a big part of it. 
as a church. Yeah, then. yeah, that was history. LCF was, that was history for me. And, and mm -hmm. uh, you know, I mean, I remember going as a, as a family sometimes, taking mm -hmm. even our kids, and, and uh, those were some wonderful times. And, and there was renewal. Yeah, and, and I think that it, it, it actually goes to how much, it's, it's in the DNA, if you will, of LCF. Yeah. Mm -hmm. This is, this is mm -hmm. part of who we are as a church, and I believe who God's calling. Mm -hmm. uh, upon us. So, uh, you know, the Western world is, it's consumed by a vision of progress. And this, this influences how we view life, right? The, the, our culture believes that we're going to eventually form a sort of utopia, that we're on this trajectory yeah. and we're going to do it through science and through technology or through politics. I mean, you see the, the visceral reactions now through politics because mm -hmm. people believe that politics is going to actually change things. Yeah. Um, and, and the view is that we just need to educate people. If you educate people in our society, they'll come on board with this. And there's this view that religion and faith are on the decline, that it's been that way for quite some time. We, we probably have, we're tempted to think like that. Um, and, and this idea that progress has replaced God's presence as the engine of history. Um, and, and our media and the entertainment all around us, everything, uh, it preaches that. All yeah. the time it preaches that at us. And so... Um, Mark Sayers in this book, he, this is just kind of a lead up to the chapter we're going to discuss, but he, he speaks of this secularist renewal myth centered around this progress, but he talks about how God is actually working patterns of renewal into history, and, um, building on one another. Yeah, and it talks about at that same point that, that God moves in waves, yeah. and he, 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 his renewal comes in, and that's the, that's the key word is renewal here. Um, <laughs> yeah. uh, but that's uh, that he moves in different waves in uh, in history and in our own lives, right? Yeah. Right. Yeah, and and so and, and the the book puts forth the idea, and I believe this is true. And Frank is that there's a new wave that's coming. That God wants to do a new thing, and so. But amidst this, there's these rolling crises that are happening in our world. We've seen this increasingly. In the past decade, uh, there, there's just human dysfunction and brokenness, corruption are being exposed. Personal crises in the lives of people, they're rising. Mental health disorders are on a steep rise. Uh, anxiety is, is just, every, there's widespread anxiety. Social disconnection, persistence of discrimination and hate and bigotry, it's not going away. Addictions are skyrocketing uh, when you look at, at various stats that are being compiled. And so, and now, the coronavirus has added this this whole new crisis that no one is escaping, yeah. and and, it, and we're all feeling it. And so, in this moment we find ourselves in, we're asking the question: What what is God saying to us about renewal in our lives? What is what does Jesus want to do in me during this time? That He's yeah. He's brought us to this moment. And what does He want to do in me? And, I, and that's the question I'm asking. And so the, the premise of this pattern of renewal that we're going to talk about is to move us from holy discontent to corporate renewal. Um, and so I want, to, I want to just together here talk a little bit about this process of renewal spoken of in Scripture. Um, because it, it, it flows throughout the story of God's people. And, and God is using people to bring his people back into relationship, into his presence, right? And so... Um, I think... Yeah, go ahead, Tom. It, it begins in the Garden of Eden, right? And how God, his intent was to have relationship with us, right? And he walked, he walked. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and then it, then with Abraham and, uh, and and even Jacob, how Jacob had relationship, even though there was a, a wrestling, but that, that was a relationship, yeah. right? That's right. Yeah, and, and, and mm -hmm. you know, using Moses to bring his people right, into freedom and relationship, this foreshadowing of Christ. We see the tent of meeting in Exodus, where it, that was all about relationship. God inviting His people into relationship and presence, um, and, and we see this all throughout the history of God's people. This, when there's disobedience and rejection of His presence, it leads them into places of brokenness and eventually into captivity. And then God uses individuals to save and bring His people back into relationship. Mm -hmm. um, what I thought, what I, one of the things I thought of though is how it says in Scripture that the people begin to cry out to to be saved and yeah. cry out yeah. to the Lord, right? And that I think is 
one of the things that we, well, frankly, that we're maybe lacking in our culture is that we need we need to begin to pray for for a renewal that would start in our own lives. Yeah, and well, the thing is, and and often, sadly, what what is um, driving people to turn to God just in 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 difficulties is the wrong is sort of the wrong motive. Like God wants us because He wants relationship with with people. He wants relationship with us. But um, one of the things that Mark said in the book there was in uh, 911 when the the attack was on the oh, towers. God, yeah. uh, then uh, the church in in Melbourne, Australia, grew for a short period of time. Yeah. And then it's and then it just kind of dwindled away again. But it's again sort of that thing where when there's uncertainty and fear, people will look for something. And and in this case, you know, th there were people who were turning for a, for a short period to God yeah. for some answers, right? But God wants more than that. Like He wants our hearts to be renewed, and He wants us to have a desire. And what I found so interesting when you look at sort of the, just pull back and look at the history of God's people in the Old Testament, all the prophets, what are they doing? They're, they're calling people back into relationship with them. Mm -hmm. And it's all yeah. about this call to repentance, yeah. it's a call to renewal, and it's a call to presence. Yeah. It's, it's Really, you can yeah. sum that up. That's what God is doing. Yeah. And that's what he, that's the call in the New Testament. Remember he says you know, in Ephesians, yeah. where in Christ we're being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. And yeah. in Ephesians 3, 19, Paul prays that yeah. we would be filled with all the fullness of God. Yeah. Uh, and then it goes on in Ephesians 4, it talks about the, that how the church were to be built up, called into maturity in Christ, into his fullness, to be renewed in our minds, it says in Ephesians 4. And then and then in 1 Peter 2, 9, and, you know, the, the scripture we know so well, but, but this is the calling on us. It says, you yeah. are a chosen people a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. And, and church, that's you. Like that, That's all yeah. of us. That is that is what's spoken over yeah. us as a whole, not not just over a certain segment, yeah. but over all of us. And so so let, let's, let's talk about this renewal pattern, moving from holy discontent to corporate revival. Because the chapter begins... Chapter two about talking about how the secular life script that we're living in it's fragile, right? Living our lives without confronting the big questions of faith, which, which people are doing all over the place, and and maybe even we are finding ourselves in that place where we're not we're not willing to talk about the big questions in our life. But that is so dependent, living like that on many large scale crucial factors that we we assume they're safe, they're secure, right? Our political, economic, and social factors. That they remain a certain way, yeah. and and this is what Mark. I was I was reviewing the chapter again today, and this is what he wrote right at the beginning of it, and it, and it stopped me in my tracks. Where he says, "If we endured a global flu pandemic like the one in the early part of the 20th century yeah. that killed millions of people across the world, how we view and process our personal potentials and possibilities would be deeply shaken." And I thought, like he wrote this last year, yeah. and now where we do we find ourselves? Um, Larry, you, you were, the other night you were talking about well, that. And, and you know, for for us personally, um, you know, not having kids in school anymore, uh, basically running a business that was able to continue uh, during this this whole pandemic time, we've been allowed to continue working, and and we've been busy and and. And so we really have, for us, we haven't really felt that much of a change other mm -hmm. than the news. You know, we're bombarded with, with things. That, and, uh, but, you know, one of the things that Mark uh, in the book uh, speaks about is if, if uh, North Korea were to cause the internet to go down. Only as an example. <laughs> Nothing is, we love Koreans. <laughs> and, and he uses them. And I mean, yeah. you know, um, but... <laughs> Uh, if, if the internet would crash, uh, that would be a whole different story for me because, I mean, Carly works from home three days a week and, you know, all of our stuff is in the cloud, pretty much, right? 
And just so, that magical cloud somewhere. <laughs> so, I mean, that would be a huge disruption for our business. Yeah. No, okay. it wouldn't cause physical uh, pain and suffering necessarily, but it would cause real um, disruption yeah. in, in our lives. And I, as, as this pandemic has in many of your lives, because with kids at home and, and those of you who are teaching, it's been an upheaval for you. I, I, you but, know. but you know, the point has been made, and I, and I feel this too, like as much as there's increased busyness and pressure mm -hmm. and all the rest of it, really at the end of the day, I'm not experiencing mm -hmm. hardship. No. Like, like, like when I read no. the New Testament, I know nothing of that kind of hardship. I, I really don't. Yeah. And, and yet, what I what I want like what I want the Lord to do to me is, God, you you brought us to this place, and you want us to see where we so badly need to be at. Well, and I think mm -hmm. the thing in all of this is that we see that society doesn't have the answer, the yeah. government doesn't have the answer. It's their day to day. They're they're scrambling to to just. Um, come up with ways to to try to be safe and keep people safe but I mean really they don't have the answers for how to navigate all of this it's it's very new yeah. we haven't seen I mean we none of us have lived in this ever I think the point to be made here is that God uses crisis in our lives at yeah. different times to help us understand that we need to be renewed in yeah. Jesus, right? Yeah. Yeah. Like my personal life needs renewal, um, not and and culture as a whole needs renewal. Yeah. And so, I'm asking questions, just like everybody else, right? God, what what are you wanting to to do on the earth in this time? Yeah. So, so let's let's define the difference here, just just so we're clear about what. And this is what Mark says in the book, and I, and I think that this is a really good way of putting it. But he, he re defines renewal as the refreshment, release, and advancement that individuals, groups, churches, and cultures experience when they are aligned with God's presence. And then, and that's point A. Point B, it's also renewal is the resumption of our God-given purpose to partner with God fully, participating in his plan to flood the world with his presence. And that's about gospel witness. Yeah. And then revival, so when we talk about what do we mean by renewal, what do we mean by revival? Revival is when renewal occurs on a large scale, mm -hmm. where it's bringing significant advancement, growth, and kingdom fruit to a city or to a people group or a movement or a region or nations. It's, it's to use a, a commonly understood term, it's renewal. <laughs> revival is renewal gone viral. Gone viral. Right? I like that. So, yeah. yeah, it's great. <laughs> so... There's some things here in the in the, the chapter um, that I just want to ask your guys' opinion. Um, sort of what what stood out to you in the first part of that chapter um, that we want we want to talk about. Um, and we're not we're not going to talk about everything this morning. We'd love to, but just for time's sake, we won't. Um, so get the book. Well. Um, the very first thing that, that I noted for myself was that um, am I completely confident that my faith is solid and unwavering? Mm -hmm. and, and that was sort of something that really, because in order for me to move towards renewal and, and just desiring more of God, I need to have a faith that's solid mm -hmm. and, and not you know, unwavering because of difficulties that come here and there, and then I find myself scrambling with, you know, what do I believe, right? Yeah. So that was something that really I felt uh, impacted me is, is where is my faith walk with the Lord? Yeah. I, I just want to read and define the holy discontentment thing. Mm -hmm. That we've said a couple times. Well, we'll, we'll get to, we'll get to that. Mm -hmm. oh, we'll let's get to let's that let's jump in the gun. Yeah, <laughs> Carlin's getting. We're, we're going to get to yeah. some stages of renewal, but that's good. Um, keep keep that phrase in your holy yeah. discontentment because that that's a lot of what we're. Um, 
talking about renewal, like the process of renewal, he said, he talked about how it's built into the world, right? That everyone understands that something's wrong in the world. We all get that, and and we desire a better future. And so there's like we naturally move toward renewal. We either yearn for it or we lament its absence. But the question is, how do we think renewal comes? Is it human-driven renewal? Do we do we enter into a process of stagnation because we're we're scourged? Do we go we can go into a decline? Or we can have a God-centered renewal in our lives. And that that's you know, that's what he's talking about here. But I think well, I think he says the heart of the matter is the heart. Right? Yeah. The heart of the matter is always the heart. So it always begins with us. Right? Yeah. And I, I really like the analogy that he used of, of uh, being a good dance partner. Yeah. And, and basically, yeah. you know, he, yeah. like renewal and revival happen in God's time. Yeah. And, and he talks about an instance uh, back in, in Australia where uh, D.L. Moody and, and I forget the other. Ari Tori. Yeah. When they. Yep. You know, it took 50 years yeah. from when they were... The people they, that started praying yeah, the, when they were for, there. for revival yeah. didn't mm-hmm. see it. Yeah. Those people didn't mm-hmm. live to see it, but it happened 50 years later. So it yeah. happens in God's time. And, and what God is saying to us is, He wants us to partner he with wants, Him when it's His time. And what stood out to me in that, thinking about that, that praying for revival and not even seeing it in our lifetime, though, is that... In the meantime, if I'm doing that, I'm submitted to Jesus, yeah. and I'm growing. Like even I may be having a personal renewal, but yeah. but I'm growing. If, if that's my position, I am praying and going after the things of God, even if I don't see it. Like I'm I'm experiencing Jesus, and uh, I was I was really actually encouraged by that. Well, and again, it's so uh, much shows us the heart of Jesus who came to serve. And, and, you know, I mean, he came to seek and to save the lost, but he came to serve. And and, and so it's not a, about necessarily, yeah, God wants to see renewal in our hearts, but am I willing to sacrifice that for the next generation? Yeah. You know, for our children. And uh, you know, that's what I really like about that blessing song. Mm. It it just that one's really impacted me on and a lot and a lot and a lot of people do that. I think yeah. it, I think it actually stirs something. Yeah. I I I think that song stirs something in us for renewal. Yeah. I think that's what it, one of the things it's actually doing because we feel it like we yeah. feel that we want God to do yeah, something. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and I think it's really interesting and neat how God partners with us. Yeah. Right? <laughs> And and then, and he chooses where he's going to when and where and how he's going to renew, but we can prepare in that yeah. for his coming. Right? There's the invitation yeah. of, hey, yeah. come and join me in this dance of what yeah. I want to do. Um, yeah. One one of the things that really starts me when talking when he talks about personal renewal that leads to corporate renewal is that this is not just for some. That all of us are called to walk the process of renewal called discipleship. All of us, and and so that every single person, it's it's not just for a select few, right? Yeah. Um, and it's it's about humbly aligning ourselves with God's purposes. Well, and it and it and it's for every part of the body of yeah. Christ. Like I like that what you said there. Like it's God is not a respecter of person. It's for everyone. God wants renewal for everyone. It doesn't matter whether we're. Whatever our call is, like God wants renewal for all of us. Well, he, he talks in the book about building a foundation for renewal mm-hmm. in our lives. And one of the things that I, I, I underlined it when I first read it and came back to it again today was he says, this renewal must begin by replacing the pseudo-Christianity of lifestyle enhancement with the spirit-filled faith of biblical Christianity. It must offer mm-hmm. the renewal of Christ-likeness to those being deformed by our culture in the deepest parts of their hearts. And I was like, oh, like I felt that. I was like, I, I, I want that. I want that for myself. I want that for culture. Like that, that's what we need. Um, let, let's, uh, let's talk a little bit here about the renewal process. You, you sort of uh, just referenced that before, <coughs> Carl, about this. Um, he, he talks about six phases for this renewal process. And then he, he kind of spends the rest of the time in the book a lot, but kind of unpacking all of this, so we're not going to do that today, but um, 
Well, well I, I think the first two are, I feel the most important. Mm -hmm. um, and, well, not necessarily the most important, but um, the first one is the holy discontentment. And I'll read a little uh, sentence here. Mm -hmm. In holy discontent, mm -hmm. here the dismay between the hunger for something better and the reality in which we are living come together from frustration or lament into holy discontent. So when we see ourselves not the way we should be, when we see our culture around us not the way we should be, um, God brings that about in our life mm -hmm. and he, he reveals that to us. And that's what we refer to as this, whole, he refers to as this holy discontentment. When we see that, that man, I'm not really following the Lord the way I should be. And, and God brings that about in our life. Yeah. And then we have hunger for, for more of Jesus um, to, to change that. And he talks about the deep dissatisfaction that begins to stir in us, like not complaining, not 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 being miserable, yeah. but that we begin to realize that we, there there is we need more of God. Mm -hmm. And and I like, I think I think I've placed myself somewhere in those first story. Well, yeah, mm -hmm. but for sure I feel like that inside myself. Like I feel this holy discontent rising, mm -hmm. um, where you know we, we we're crying out to God. Mm -hmm. To change, and Larry, you, you said this. Like you said it earlier, where there needs to be discontentment. Actually, things need to push us to that. Yeah. To to push us to God. Yeah. Yeah. Because if, if if we stay, otherwise we stay comfortable. Yeah. And I and that's I mean that for me I think that's the danger in our culture that that is so pervasive. Yeah. Um, you know, and he talks he talks in there about preparation and. Uh, and he says there that, that the preparation primarily occurs through the process of confession and repentance, which I think is just so thoroughly biblical in so many respects. And, and that's the place that God has to bring us to as mm -hmm. a church where we are we're recognizing. Uh, actually, John Tyson, he, he was preaching a message as a student to it. He was talking about this, that um, in revivals, people would talk about when they felt the presence of God, they would feel the weight mm -hmm. of all their sin. They said it's like nothing they've ever felt. They would feel the weight of the entirety of their sin on them. Wow. And they didn't even know what to do until Jesus came yeah. and just removed it. And I was like, like there, there's something to that that would lead you into the awe of going, oh, like the awe of a holy God. Mm -hmm. um, you want to maybe, Larry, you want to talk about contending maybe because you... You were struck by that. Well, yeah, and, and uh, so that's phase three is contending. Yeah, uh, I also, and I don't know if we got by that but, uh, spot where we're, I was oh, just going to bring up a little bit the the Ezekiel. No, that's that's in contending. Is, is that okay? That was yeah. in contending. Okay, yeah. so so in in Ezekiel chapter twenty two, um, it's it's a it's a very um, enlightening scripture for what we're talking about here and that is that um, Jerusalem uh, basically was living in absolute sin and degradation I mean they had completely turned away from God yeah. and um, and then basically uh, God is calling for someone to stand in the gap who's going to contend for my people and there isn't one. And, and I just, like, it just made my heart cry that who is standing in the gap? Who of us are willing to, to stand in the gap? And, and, base, and, and I really feel that in order for us to have that heart, we need to have renewal and a desire to see God work in our lives, I want to stand in the gap for my kids. I want to stand in the gap for you, church. Mm -hmm. And I want you to be standing in the gap for others as well. Um, and, and so that was, that, that whole thing of, yeah, who, 
Who am I contending for? He, so he defines contending as the act of moving from a life posture of consumption and passivity to one of contending for God's presence to come with yeah. power. And that, that really gripped me. Like, yeah. I want to move to that. I want to move yeah. from, if there's areas of passivity in my life, yeah. I want to move to one of, I'm contending for God's presence. Yeah. And that's the other, yeah, that's the, that aspect. Yeah. And, and that, it's standing, standing yes. in the gap. And yeah. That's that contending. And then yeah. He talks about holy patterns. And, and I, yeah. So I was going to say, before you get into that, I think this, what I'll read here is, is how we, is, is how, it's, well, it's why, but stepping into personal renewal that God, stepping into personal renewal that God wishes for us is the surest level lever for influencing right. those around us, yeah. our family, our kids, or the organi organization, or and organization. Mm -hmm. So yeah. yeah. And, and the way we get there is what one of the way the things Paul's going to talk about here. Yeah, he, did, he just says phase four is holy patterns. So it's, it's reorientating our life from patterns that enable us to live and operate in God's presence. It's, it's yeah. patterns of formation, right? It's yeah. spiritual formation in our lives that begin to take shape. So it's, it's again, it's about what practices and habits am I forming in me that's going to help me live a vital life connected to Christ? And we'll, we'll talk a little bit actually in a few minutes here about how we see that even, how we how we see that happening in LCF and, and some of these, but uh, and then he says that goes on uh, to a remnant, a group of individuals being renewed by God. They come together then to contend for God to move powerfully. In. You know, groups in the church, as a church as a whole, we can begin, and I think that's our heart that that we would be growing as a remnant where we're contending for God's presence powerfully together. Yeah. And then the last stage with boy we would want is that moves then into actual renewal. That a renewal is taking place in the lives of people. And I think you we you brought it up when we were discussing this before we went on camera, but and I, and it struck me is do we believe that this can happen? Like yeah. church, do we believe that this can happen? Do we believe that we can we can actually see this happen in our church in our region in our area in our towns in our families like that personal renewal yeah. is something that's possible yeah. and and i think one thing that this book has been doing for me it's filling me with faith and hope and and again according to the word going yeah it is possible yeah i think we sometimes doubt that that can happen and then that leads us to complacency right yeah because we just yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. so I want to, we want to bring this back home for us as a church, but how do we see this application to LCF? What, what do we see, let's just talk here for a couple minutes about what do we see as renewal principles or practices as a church that, that will lead to this growth and hunger being birthed in us? Well, I think, again, one of the things that, that came through clearly in the book here was that we are going to have to be willing to to repent where we've fallen short and, and where we have sinned, we're, we're going to have to repent and and uh, and seek God's forgiveness in in many different areas. It'll be different for different ones, you know. And um, that's one area where where we're going to have to. And 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 one of the things that that I thought of this afternoon when I was looking at this again was just. Why, why do we not want to repent? And it's, it's pride. Or fear. Or fear. Yeah. But that, which is but, also pride. Yeah. But I just, you know, because we don't want to tell people our little secrets or whatever it is. And, and yet God wants us to just bear our hearts. And, and I think that's one of the things that has to happen for, for revival to begin. Yeah. Some of the things that we've been talking about in this, as, as far as renewal practices, is you know encouraging one another and want, wanting to encourage us in the church is is the growth of a devotional life. Yes, that, that yeah. it's just it's absolutely essential. Like union with Christ, growing yeah. with Jesus, getting into His Word, uh, prayer, and, and and we feel I think we feel that really strongly. You know, we are called to contend in prayer for this. Uh, I know 
one of the things that God is stirring in me right now is a very simple prayer of God make me hungry and give us hungry people. Yeah. Like that's that's what I'm praying for. Yeah. And, uh, and learning to hear God is one of those things, right? Yeah. That can help us to grow and help us to to come into a more which is you know, maybe it feels like that's a course that we've offered, but really that the intent is actually is to grow a discipline within ourselves of and confidence that God actually speaks to us and his word talks for that and finding freedom in Christ, inviting more of the Holy yeah. Spirit into our life, which um, we we feel that's why we feel so passionate about something like set free. Mm-hmm. Because we we believe it's not the only thing, but it's a step to take us into freedom. Mm-hmm. Um, in our lives, which, which you know, for many, then it goes on into to different areas, and, and I find, even personally myself, that's the case. But um, you know, in growing in gospel witness, Larry, you even talked about that before, right? But how do you how do you walk this out in a business context, yeah. and how do we grow gospel witness in our lives, um, where we're not living in fear of neighbors, and and we're not we're, we're living passionately for Christ before everyone. Yeah. There, there, there's no there's no separation. Um, and I think, too, one of the things, and, and I was sharing with the guys earlier, but in those areas where we maybe struggle a little bit more or where we're really desiring to see God be at work more in our lives, like I said, I, I really want to uh, be more bold in my witness uh, to my trades and different people that I encounter throughout the week. And I said to them, one of the things is for me to have an accountability uh, where where they would just ask me mm-hmm. on a weekly basis, Larry, how you know how did it go this week? Um, you know how did you do with with talking to people about Jesus? And and then you know so it, it kind of gives me a little more incentive <laughs> that I want to come back with a good report, right? <laughs> yeah. You know, I mean, we need to be accountable, and if we're accountable yeah. to one another, that's how we can grow. I, I think, to be honest, when I look at it, accountability in my life. Has probably been one of the biggest catalysts for growth. If I look at the last 20 years of my life, accountability in my life to other people and being willing when they call me and stuff mm-hmm. that I'm teachable and I'm actually willing to repent and walk. Yeah. That that has led to the biggest shift, mm-hmm. probably of almost along with other, but that's been a huge shift for me. Yeah. Um, we you know we, we could talk about this for so long. Like I I would love to yeah. want to talk about this, and maybe there's a part two, I'm not sure, but um, I, want, I want to end just by sharing a word from the Lord that, that I got this week that I, I feel really fit with this and I felt like it wasn't by accident the Lord uh, shared this but the context was I was praying this one morning for hunger and um, I felt the Lord lead me I, I had already read John 7 the previous day I felt him tell me Paul go back and read John 7 again and what stuck out to me there was where Jesus says if anyone thirsts let him come to me and drink. Mm-hmm. And that, that, that phrase just, it stood out because I've been praying for hunger and thirst. And, and the Lord, I felt him say, do a, hung, do a word search on thirst. So I just did a quick word search on my phone and I'm looking. And Psalm 107 stood out to me. And I want to read a few verses from there. Um, because as I was, as I was reading this, and, and I read it on my phone first, and it says this in verses 4 to 9. Some wandered in desert wastes, finding no way to a city to dwell in. Hungry and thirsty, their soul fainted within them. Then they cried to the Lord in their trouble, and he delivered them from their distress. He led them by a straight way till they reached a city to dwell in. Let them thank the Lord for his steadfast love, for his wondrous works to the children of man, for he satisfies the longing soul and the hungry soul he fills with good things. Mm-hmm. And then I was led to another set of verses that my eyes really just came upon, where he turns a desert into pools of water, a parched land into springs of water, and there he lets the hungry dwell and they establish a city to live in. They sow fields and plant vineyards and get a fruitful yield by his blessing, they multiply greatly, and he does not let their livestock diminish. And when I read that, I felt the Lord say, Paul, this is for LCF. This is for you. This is for the church. And I like, I was captivated. And I need to pray. I went into my Bible later in the day. I wanted to look at it again. I opened up my Bible and 
And I, I wrote this, and I forgot I wrote this in little margins. Pray for God to do this in Landmark, September 2019. And I was like, okay, yeah. God. Yeah. Like, I'd forgotten. And I, I don't know how to describe it other than just in the clearest way possible. He, he just reaffirmed, like, Paul, you need to pray this, and this is what I want to do. Yeah. Like, he wants to turn parched land into springs of water. If you're thirsty, if you're thirsty, if we're thirsty, come to him who has living water. And so, church, we, we want to just, we're, we're going to pray to end, but I, I want to just encourage you to pray that this is stirring something inside of you this morning and go after the things of God that he's speaking to you. So, Jesus, we thank you for this morning. Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you, Holy Spirit, that you are moving and acting in our midst and you want us to partner with you and mm -hmm. pray and contend for renewal. And so, Lord, we're asking you to do that in our hearts, Lord, right now, that, that where we need personal renewal and growth, Lord, would you get a hold of us? Would you do everything that you want to do? And we pray this, Jesus, in your wonderful, mighty, and powerful name. Amen. 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 Church, bless you. Carla, thank you. Larry, thank you. Yeah, this was a joy. It was rich. So. Yeah. Church, have a, a wonderful... We're, we're going to worship now, so let's yeah. worship together and just enjoy the presence of Jesus yeah. together. Amen.
Well, church, I don't know if that song has been moving you as much as I know it has many, many people. That song has been going all around the world, literally. And there's something about this song that is stirring the hearts of people. And I was thinking about that the last couple days, and we, we talked about it in the the round table that we just had and that you watched and that was a very impromptu comment that was made and, and about how there's something about this song and singing about the blessing and singing it over others that is about contending contending for this generation but also for the coming generations contending for the move of God and you know, truth be told, I had something else that I had recorded for the end of the service today, and, and I felt good about it. And then as I started thinking about this yesterday and today, and as we led into this, I thought, as hard as it is through a screen, there's something about contending, especially coming out of this discussion and this thirst and this hunger for renewal that we're feeling and, and God is stirring in us. There's something about allowing the Holy Spirit to move and, and even right now, this isn't normal. This isn't ideal. I wish that there was a room full of people here and we could just contend and cry out together and ask the Lord to move and just allow Him to move in our hearts because I feel it. I feel like God wants to move so, so badly. And he wants us to contend. And so as, as strange as it may be, and it's not ideal, we're going to make room right now. We're going to make room in our homes, in our living rooms, wherever we are, to contend and to cry out and say, Holy Spirit, would you move? Would you do something in our hearts? Would you move us? Would you, would you awaken a holy discontent in us where we are wanting to prepare and contend for a move of God, for a move of renewal in our midst? And again, the question that we asked, and I want to ask it is, again, is do you believe? Do you believe that a move of God, a work of renewal is possible? And I believe because the Bible tells me that it is truth. And God is, he's inviting us. He's inviting us in right now to contend. I want to read something. We read it in our discussion together. And I was just reminded again, Ephesians 3, where Paul prays. He's praying for the church. He's praying this over the people. God is praying this over us. This is God's heart for us. Church, this is his heart for you. That Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. That you being rooted and grounded in love, may have strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth, and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. And I want to this morning, I want to allow room to invite the Holy Spirit and ask the Holy Spirit and contend that we would be filled with all the fullness of God. Do you want to contend for that this morning? And I want to invite you, wherever you are, to cry out, to contend. Say, God, I'm hungry. And where I'm not hungry, make me hungry. I'm thirsty. And where I'm not thirsty, make me thirsty. And so we're just going to wait. And we're going to invite the Holy Spirit right now to do His work amongst us. Holy Spirit, would you come? Would you come? Would you break our hearts where we need to be broken? God, would you stir hunger inside of us? God, would you make me hungry? Lord, would you make us as a church hungry? Would we be hungry for the presence of God? Would we not settle for anything else?
Holy Spirit, would you blow afresh on us? For we are in such desperate need of a move of your Spirit, where we are desperately in need of moving and, and having a much greater sense of our need for confession and repentance. God, would you move in us? God, would we not be satisfied? God, would you, al- would you not allow us to be satisfied? Would you make us have a holy discontent for the way things are that we would want nothing else but more of a move of your Spirit? Awake in our hearts, God. Awake in our hearts, God. Would you till up where we have fallow ground, where it's hardened. Lord, would you make springs of water to well up inside of us? Church, I just, I again want to say that the word that the Lord gave me that I shared there about from Psalm 107 this week, the word when he gave it to me, he impressed that upon me with such force. And I, I was, I was so, so taken by that this week. And I just, again, I want to just pray that over us. And I want to somehow through a camera communicate that I believe this is God's heart for us. LCF, I believe that is God's heart. I believe he's stirring that inside of us. He wants to stir that inside of us. And I believe that he wants us collectively to be crying out for that. That where there's deserts, where we're dry and weary, that we'd be crying out for those springs of living water. Jesus, we welcome you to do the work that you need to do in us right now. I want to invite you wherever you are to right now just say very simply, Jesus, please make me hungry. Jesus, please make me thirsty for you. Increase my desperation. It's a dangerous prayer. It's a dangerous prayer to pray, but I'm inviting you. God's inviting us. Pray. Increase my desperation. However you have to do it, God, would you increase my desperation for you? By whatever means possible, you have to do it. Make me desperate. leave you with this. Where is God calling you this week to make one change in order to grow your desperation and to contend for more of his presence in your life? 
allow the Lord to speak to you about that. May his presence go before you. May his presence go behind you. All around you. May his favor be with you. This week. Have a wonderful week. And let's just continue to allow the Holy Spirit to speak and to move inside of us. This is not the end. Let's go forth from here and let's invite the presence of Jesus to move in us this week. Amen. We love you. We're praying for you. Have a great week, church. And let's pray that God is going to increase our hunger this week. Amen. to you.